All right, well, hope you had a fantastic week. Uh, but before we jump into the message that I prepared for today, I just want to ask, um, has anyone had a chance to practice what Pastor Barb spoke on last time? Um, recognizing the least of these among us, just reaching out, loving them, serving them in, in, in the ways that, that God has taught us to love and serve anyone. I mean, this is something that we want to continue. Um, you know, the other day I was at, um, I was at McDonald's and, um, I saw this young man coming in, um, and I, you know, he was struggling to, to order his food as if like he was trying to find the cheapest options on the menu. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit, um, nudging me, telling me, Hey, go pay for his meal. So I kind of stepped in cause he was, he was, uh, um, as he was making uh, his order, I just kind of stepped in and told him, hey, you know what, um, get whatever you want. I'll, I'll cover it. And, and he was like, dude, are you, are, you trying to, are you trying to spoil me? And I said, why not? You know, this is your day. Um, get whatever you want. And long story short, um, I, I bought his, his meal um, and he, he, want, he, he got something else that um, he wanted to get, but he didn't have money to, but I, I just like throw all in, you know, um, long story short, I, we exchanged our names. His name is Joshua, freshman in high school. Um, I just blessed him and, and he got his food and he, he went his way. And, and I was like, man, dude, I, sh I should have said something about like, Jesus loves you or any of that kind of stuff. Like, dude, I'm, I'm buying this because I'm not creepy, man. But, you know, just, I just want to tell you that, you know, you're loved, you, you're, you're so valuable in the sight of God and all that. I didn't say any of that. So, oh man, I should have said that. But then Holy Spirit said, hey, don't worry about it. You did that by buying him food that he couldn't afford. Um, so I was like, okay, you know, we're sowing seeds, right? Everything that we do, we, we're sowing seeds. Uh, and I believe that as we go back to our building on 4th of July, our focus must be on uh, loving those outside our building as much as it is about loving God and each other inside the building. You know, it has to be us living it out every day, living out love, living out grace, living out generosity, living out hope in the world so that the world would know that God is infinitely and uh, it. So let's just continue to practice this, uh, practice it. Let's make this our, our culture at one, amen. Um, today, I'm gonna, like, like what Pastor Barb said, I'm just gonna piggyback on what Pastor Barb preached last, for, uh, last Sunday. If um, her message is the outward expression of our culture, today's message is focusing on the culture I would love to see within ourselves, both individually, and, and corporately as a church family. So we're gonna to go to Mark six, feeding 5,000. We're familiar with, with what happened. So um, Jesus sent his disciples two by two, and they, they went and they the ministry, casting out demons and, and healing the sick, preaching the, all these different things. And they came and, and said to Jesus, hey, this, this is what we did. And just said, good, good job, we're gonna go off. Uh, to a to a quiet place and let's just rest together um but you know what happens people saw them getting on the boat and they they ran it says um they ran from all the towns and they got there on the shore before they arrived that jesus and disciples arrived and out of compassion jesus started teaching um and after jesus finished his teaching the disciples um they, they saw that they didn't have enough food for everyone. So imagine 13 people, you're one of the 13, right? And looking at, it says 5,000 men, so maybe 10,000, maybe 15,000 people right in front of you, and they're all hungry, they're all tired. To get their own food probably is the only reasonable option. But Jesus says to disciples, you feed them, go look for food. So they did, they, and they brought, you know, as we know, five loaves of bread and two fish from a boy. And they fed everybody and they had 12 baskets full of leftovers. 
And if we jump to Mark 8, same thing happens with four, feeding 4,000. You know, disciples reacted to the situation as they did before in the same way. And they said, how can one feed these people with bread here in, in this desolate place? Right? But Jesus, again, fed 4,000 people, maybe more probably, um, with seven loaves of bread and a few fish. And they had seven baskets full of leftovers. It's a two amazing miracles of God's supernatural provision and abundance, feeding thousands and thousands of people with small amount of food, you know? And I always love how Jesus says to his disciples, you feed them. And I, I would love to see their faces when, they, when Jesus said that. It's like, what do you mean we feed them? We don't have anything, you know? I would, uh, but also like, I would, I would, love to um, hear the excitement as, as Jesus blessed the food, broke it, and divided among the disciples to, to distribute it to the, uh, the, to the crowds, I would love to hear the excitement among the crowds as they start seeing the food multiplying right in front of, in front of their eyes, you know? I mean, it's truly a life-changing experience, and um, Obviously, we can never know exactly what happened, but I can only imagine the impact these miracles must have had on people. This is something that you cannot, oh yeah, something happened. Oh yeah, um, we had a small amount of food and thousands of people ate and we had leftovers. Eh, that's another day. Let's move on. No, it's a life-changing experience that, would, that you would like hold closely in your heart and keep repeating keep telling people whoever you meet dude you have no idea what happened we like there are so many people we have so little food and everybody ate like wherever you go right you know i remember our friend john pascarella sharing his own encounter of this exact miracle he went on a mission trip um, I don't know exactly where, maybe it was uh, Cambodia or one of those places. Um, and, and his team prepared a meal for the locals to, to just treat them, to just love on them, to serve them. Uh, but people came to their, to their event, uh, but way more people showed up. Um, and obviously food was running, running out. So they, the team got together and, and, and they said, you know what, let's just, let's just believe in the miracle of Jesus Christ. Let's just pray for uh, whatever that we have left and we'll see what happens. So they prayed for the meal and they right in faith. And the miracle was after everyone was fed, food didn't run out, but actually had leftovers. And John took the picture of it and he showed it to people continuously as, as whenever we, we talk about these kind of miracles. He's like, oh yeah, I, rem I remember. It's like, let me show you a picture. And he pulls out his phone and he shows us the picture of the leftover food. I mean, these miracles allow us to see the glimpse of the reality of the kingdom of God and mark us for the rest of our lives to live with a different mindset. Miracles helps us to have transformed mindset, to live differently. But we see in Mark 8, 14, disciples forgot these miracles again. It says this, now they had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf uh, with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out, be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another with the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Don't you remember the miracle of feeding 5,000? How many baskets full of the leftovers were there? Twelve. And when we fed 4,000, how many baskets full of the leftovers? Seven. And Jesus said to them, do you not yet understand? 
we have to know that all the miracles that Jesus did ultimately served one purpose. And it is the purpose of transforming the minds of disciples so that they too would live and think like Jesus. Because Jesus, though he lived fully as one of us, he always lived in and lived out the greater reality of the kingdom. All of Jesus' miracles and signs and wonders were the manifestation of the reality that he lived from. It simply flowed out of him naturally because he always lived in unity with God and unity with his kingdom. So he never lived in insecurity of who he was. You know, he, when, when Satan came and, and tempted him, right, in the wilderness after 40 days and 40 nights of, of him fasting, he tempted that area of Jesus' life. If you are the son of God, Right? It wasn't a physical um, thing that the saint tempted, but it was the identity of Jesus Christ that he tempted. If you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, right? And we also know that Jesus never lived in fear of his circumstances, whether it's the raging storms or threats of religious leaders, even to the point of his death on the cross. He never lived in lack. You know, I love that he paid his tax with a coin from fish's mouth. Maybe we all need to get some fish, you know, at our house, you know, and pray. All right, this tax season. All right, let's see what this fish bring, right? Or, or, or a dog, or for me, it's, it's three cats. So I get, we got three coins. I don't know, you know, but he never li lived in lack. He always lived in, with, in, in, with, um, with solutions, not problems. You know, problems were to Jesus. Problems were simply opportunities for him to show the world, uh, show the world how powerful and, and good God was. And I believe this is why Jesus continually, continually said to disciples, because they were not getting it. Do you not yet understand? And it was not about miracles, but it was about who they are in his kingdom and what is available for them. Jesus wanted them to learn that it's the, it's the mustard seed size faith that moves the mountain. Feeding thousands of people with a small amount of food. And, and you know, and, and it's, it's impossible in the minds of the world, in the minds of the flesh. But, but we know that nothing is impossible with God. And that's something that God, uh, Jesus wanted his disciples to learn from being in the midst of these miracles and signs and wonders. You know, I was thinking about this boy who had five loaves of fish, no, five loaves of bread and two fish. You know, I wonder what he was thinking as disciples were, were asking around, you know, going around the crowd and asking for like, hey, does anyone have food, right? In fact, I, I wonder if he was the only one who had food that day among these 10,000, 15,000 people. I highly doubt that. I highly doubt that he was the only one with food, but I am 100% sure that he was the only one with childlike faith and imagination for greater things. I believe he wasn't even thinking like, you know, Jesus will feed everyone with, with my food, with my lunch. No, but I believe that it was more like, I wonder, I wonder what he can do with what I give him. And I know that he will do so much more than what I can expect. Because how many of you know that imagination is the quality of a sonship, sons and daughters in the kingdom of God, as you grow in your relationship with him? Sons, daughters can imagine, can dream dreams, but, but uh, uh, orphans or slaves cannot do that because they are in this restricted mindset, um, living in lack, living in limitation, right? 
while disciples and and probably everybody who was there that day saw what they did not have and came to a logical and reasonable conclusion that it is impossible to feed everyone no matter how much food they had so so it is better to send them away so that they can get food on their own but can I say that, that a logical and reasonable conclusion is what we settle with when the reality of, our, reality of our lack is greater than the reality of the kingdom of God. It's the life with constant worry for the future. It is the life where we must be in control. So we, we micromanage every little thing. You know, it's, it's the life that prevents us to be grateful and generous because what we need is always more important than, than what, we, what others need, right? And it actually robs us of our inheritance in the kingdom because we will always see what is not in our hands or, or even worse, we will always look at what others have in their hands and compare our stops with them. Anyone? I've done that many times. I wish I had what, what that person has. I wish what, what Pastor Steve has. His brilliant mind, you know? Um, his accent. <laughs> um, you know, we do that all, all the time. And we, we see all these things that, that other people have and we see what, what, what's in our hands and what is not in our hands compared to them. And we say, God, what am I gonna do, right? So instead of worshiping God, instead of celebrating him, instead of uh, praising for his goodness and generosity and abundance, we complain. It, does not, it, it really doesn't get us anywhere. Right, and, and we're missing the point. And the point is that you and I are wonderfully and fearfully made, uniquely designed in his image and likeness to do what you and I are called to do and destined to do for the kingdom of God that no one else can do. Each and every one of you, there is the divine design for you that, that God was, was so excited about when he created you, which something that you cannot, uh, no one can do um, if, if it's not you, right? So you do have a lot in your hands. I have a lot in my hands. The question is, are we seeing it? You know, First Samuel 17, uh, David and Goliath, right? Goliath has been terrorizing the army of Israel, as well as King Saul, for 40 days and 40 nights, right? Um, and can you imagine this massive giant? The Bible says he's like 10 feet tall, right? With, with bronze helmet and armor and, and shin guard, all these different things, weighing, weighing like hundreds of pounds, right? And swinging his big sword and spears and, and shouting insult and challenging the whole army. And his voice just echoes. And the people of Israel, it says, everyone lost all hope. And here comes David, a young guy carrying doing a Uber eat for his brothers, right? Carrying lunch sacks. And when everyone was terrified, David says to Saul, I'll kill him. You know, just like I killed lions and bears with my hands that came after my flock, I'll kill this giant, you know? And then verse 38, Saul brings him in, right? Saul brings him into his tent and he says, then Saul clothed, David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head, clothed him with a coat of armor. David strapped a sword over his armor and all that stuff. And David, knowing that these things were not for him, he took them all off. Instead of he, he took his staff, he chose five stones from the river and went out face on this giant with a sling in his hand. And that's all he had. And we know the rest. 
David killed a giant with what was in his hand, a sling and a stone. And seeing David killing this giant Goliath, the whole army of Israel rose against a Philistine army and destroyed them. You know, can you imagine how the story would have changed if David was not sure of who God said he was? Or if David chose to believe that, that um, he would have a better chance with Saul's armor and sword against Goliath instead of what was in his hand. He believed in what God has declared over his life. He believed in how faithful God has been in his daily routine, caring for the flock, fighting lions and, and bears. You know, he believed in what he had in his hand because it wasn't stones that, that killed a giant, but it was God who empowered David to conquer any enemies. And how many of you know that this is the season and time where David in us needs to stand against the giants in front of us so that the world, the, the, the army around us could rise in, 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 in confidence and boldness and faith to go fight the enemy. Or how about, how about Gideon, right? When the angel appeared to him saying, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Go save Israel from the hand of Midian. And Gideon replied, we know this. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest and I am the least in my father's house. And, and Gideon put God through different tests. And, 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 and finally, Gideon, okay, let's do this. And when, when Gideon called people to fight with him, there were like 30,000, 33,000 people uh, joining him. But then when God told him to say to the crowd, to the army, whoever is fearful and trembling, you can go home. Probably not the best thing to say, you know? Because after he said that, 22,000 people left him. I mean, can you imagine the panic Gideon was going through at that moment, seeing all these people leaving? It's like, why did you come in the first place? You know, um, and then once again, once again, um, that number dropped to 300 and that's all Gideon was left with. And I don't know about you, but if I were, if I were him, like, all right, I trust you. Or I think I'm trusting you. I think I have some kind of faith at this point. But I don't know what to do. You know, either I need extra, 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 extra amount of faith right now or something. But how many of you know that it only takes one man with a mustard seed faith who trusts God and his divine plans against all odds to bring freedom and victory to a nation? You know, I was praying as I was preparing for this message, and I've been praying, God, I might be the least of these among many who have talents, skills, resources, experiences, but I trust you, and I trust your sovereign plan and purposes for me. You know, things will not make sense to me, and that's okay. I might not have any clues what to do, uh, but that's okay, because I have you, and I trust your promises. I trust your plans. I know you are good, and that will never change. So here I am. That was my prayer. And in that prayer, God asked this question that, that we have said many times, what is in your hands, right? As Ed Silvoso said, what is in your hands? And he, he asked me this, just look at your hands and see what's there. And I expected to see great tools, weapons, or, or one of those things. But I didn't see any of those things in my hands. The only thing that I saw 
the only thing that God showed me was his strong hands holding my hands. And I, my, I, I could feel my spirit uh, with excitement, shouting, thank you, God. Because this is all I ever need. As long as I have you, as long as you're with me, I'm good. So my question for all of us this morning, and especially as we prepare to start a new season, is what is in your hands? And I want to challenge you to remember, like we have eight years of history together, right? And I don't have time to tell you of all the miracles and signs and wonders that God has done in and, 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 and through us, you know? Uh, like, I wish I could give me an hour, maybe, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll share, you know, um, or, or a week, right? Um, but I, I just, I, there are so many stories, you know, how God connected us with pastors and churches in the city of Claremont, which has never done before. You know, someone who ministered in Claremont for over uh, 40 years, he said, no one, I have never seen something like this in my ministry here in 40, 40 years. But we were, we've been getting together every Friday, praying together, building relationship, right? How God fulfilled his promise um, to bring us to the center of Claremont, you know, as he prophesied through many different people. And he did that from the very edge of Claremont, city of Claremont to the very center of Claremont. How God gave us people in, in, uh, in the city government and different sectors in our society to serve and mentor them in kingdom truth, you know? Just like what, what Pastor Steve said last time about Pastor Barb um, or the, uh, the people in the, in the postal office wanting to see Pastor Barb because she carries that heart of, you know, just of, of, of love and, and grace and, and servant heart to everyone in the city. Imagine how if, if people want to, you know, wherever we go, we at the people at people in the city asking about, hey, how's life as one doing? Because of what you carry, because you work with the with the kingdom of God, with what has given, uh, what God has given to you in your hands. One thing that I want to I want to remind us is that God will never, He has never failed. To surprise us with the least of these that we gave him um, in our faith. He always exceeded our expectation, blessed us beyond our imagination, and I truly believe that he continue to expand his kingdom in and through us as we partner with him in faith with the least of these in our hands. So family, as we practice, continue to practice loving the least of these around us, let us also partner with God with the least of these in your hands. May God take us higher and farther beyond our expectation in the coming season. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for always being ever so faithful always leading and guiding us, always teaching and equipping us with the truth of your kingdom and always upgrading us and transforming our minds from glory to glory. In our daily walk with you, let us not despise the least of these in our hands, but to trust you with it, that you will use it to, to advance your kingdom in and through us. The smallest thing in our hands, you will bring it and magnify it through who you are. And I pray that in the coming season, we both, both individually and as a church family, that we will see your greater works as we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>